All right, everything looks good. That's there, that's there. Okay. Too many things going on in one morning for me to handle everything. But we're here, we're doing this. Let's get this started already. Hello, Shadowcat back, and today, today I'm not prepared. Uh, we're going to be talking about cultural erasure. And just in case there's any kind of ambiguity, ambi amb ambiguity, a ambiguity, yes. I've put the emphasis on the wrong syllable. In case there's any ambiguity in that, I want to talk about basically how you take a section of a population and just kind of make it go away. That's the topic of today. So, why don't we go ahead and turn down the background music just a little bit. There we go. Much better. And I see JP's in the chat already. JP says, just today. Just today what? As in, just today is crazy? No, today's extra crazy. I'm used to dealing with crazy. Today's extra crazy. Also, I can't even read my own chat. Hold on, I gotta make this bigger. There we go. 225%. Now I can read it. I wasn't lying when I said I'm blind. I need my 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 uh, text to be like one inch high. In other words, in other words, for me to be able to uh, to read it. Oh, not prepared to start. No, that's that's every day. I'm not I'm not ready for anything. Like I don't even have notes for this one because this one's gonna be very much off the cuff. I gotta tell you, um. I had to kind of throw this all together in less than a day because I've been busy throughout the week and I didn't have anything prepared. I thought about it and it's like, no, I don't, I don't know what I'm talking about this Saturday. And then, and then I was given a gift. I was given the gift of inspiration. And if I can find it. If I can find it, let's see. The the gift of inspiration was given to me here. Uh, where's my OBS? There's my OBS. Here we go. Did anybody else know that this was this was happening? There is a live action how to train your dragon coming. I didn't know this was coming. I still don't know all the details about it. Honestly, I was not... I never even saw How to Train Your Dragon until, like, the third one was out. It was not something that I was terribly interested in, even though I do like DreamWorks stuff. I mean, Kung Fu Panda is one of my favorite movies. But I just... It, it wasn't on my radar, so I never heard about it. But then somebody brought it up to me, and I'm just like, oh, okay. So, um, that's going to be a disaster. That That's going to be the worst thing ever. And it's like, it, it's weird, because I would expect this from Disney. But from DreamWorks? I didn't see that coming. But anyway, they brought this up for two specific reasons. Number one. It's a live-action How to Train Your Dragon, which means that it's going to be awful. Because everything that has been turned live-action is awful. And number two... I wonder if it's down here. Um... It is not front and center, but that's okay, because I'm going to get to this later. But basically, uh, it can for two reasons. Number one, the first is going to be awful. The second is, the movie was just announced. I mean, it hasn't even been out that long. This is all two days ago. This one's one day ago. It was just announced. And they're already changing it. Specifically, they're already going through the cast of characters 
and they're changing the characters. Why? Because of course they are. Because that's how we do things nowadays. And it occurred to me that perhaps we should sit down, we should talk about this, because there is a genuine effort right now in the modern Western world. Now, I can't say the world as a whole, because the Eastern world is not doing this. This is specifically an action taken by the West. There is, there is an effort in the West being made to eradicate an entire culture. It is literally a cultural genocide being committed. But it's being done in a very slow, a very methodical, a very deliberate way. But just because it's being done differently does not mean that it, this is something that we have not seen before in history. So I want to talk about cultural erasure. Again, cultural erasure, as I stated, is not new. We have seen it many times before. If you go back in history, mostly to things like prehistory, where things just were not recorded, we can see what happened because we have people who spend all of their lives digging around in dirt looking for artifacts, looking for clues as to what happened, and what we can tell is that once upon a time, back before we had, you know, major population centers and things like that, we had tribes. Now, every tribe would have roughly its own culture, but of course, every tribe was in contest with each other tribe for territory, for resources, things like that. Warfare is, for a reason, one of humanity's greatest inventions. Greatest because it's one of the first things that we have ever invented, and it persists all the way until today. Nothing in history will ever top war in mankind's inventions, and so many other inventions have come from it. Now, the reason I bring that up is because, way back then, <clears throat> if you went to war, it was a war to the end. There was no such thing as a peaceful re or reconciliation afterwards, generally. The things that usually happened is, two tribes would go to war, they would fight, and the fighting would only end when one of them was gone. Oh, what's this? Doesn't involve me. Ignoring it. Thought it was important. It's not important. So the end result of two tribes going to war is that one tribe would cease to exist. And then what would happen? Well, that tribe would gain all their territory, it would gain all their resources, and the other tribe would cease to exist. Now, sometimes this would involve wiping out everybody in the tribe. Sometimes it would mean taking prisoners, or generally speaking, slaves of some kind. Women would be taken by the men, children would be incorporated into different families, they would be re-educated, and they would be integrated with the successful tribe. The old tribe would cease to exist, the new one would expand. This is how mankind operated for hundreds to thousands of years. And it didn't just stop, either. Generally speaking, even when you got into the point where people were making population centers, when we were starting to create agriculture, we were starting to do crafting, we were making things like economics, things like this, war still happened. A good example, of course, would be the Persian Empire. The Persian Empire started off as just the Persians, obviously. However, they were very warlike, and they were very good at what they did. And so what they did is they just expanded. And every single time they came across another culture, they would roll over it, and they would incorporate it into their own. Sometimes, if that culture had something they could use, such as new warfare tactics, new weapons, new tact or new strategies, new things like that, they would take it and they would incorporate it. 
But anything else that they did not need, their music, their art, their culture as a whole, would be stamped out. I mean, even though it was, um, it was very, like, turned up to 11, the movie 300 between the Spartans and the Persians was a great example of that. I don't have the clip here pulled up, but during the meeting between King Leonidas and um, God Emperor Xerxes, when Leonidas turned him down, Xerxes told him flat out, there will be no honor in this. I will have every single parchment burned. I will have every statue reduced to dust. Every scholar will have their, their tongues cut out. It will be punishable by death to even mention the name Sparta. Now, of course, that is a movie, and that was very dramatized, but it wasn't false, because that's how warfare used to work. It's also one of the reasons why, in the West, we've had such a, a contentious issue when it comes to the Aboriginals, whether it's the Aboriginals in Canada or the Aboriginals in the U.S., or what we might also call the Native Americans. Except, you know, Canada doesn't have Native Americans, so Native Canadians? Something like that. The big problem, of course, is that, you know, these people were abused. Horrifically. And nobody will deny that. The one thing that makes what happened in the United States and Canada different from what happened pretty much everywhere else in the world is that there are still people left to complain about it. See, generally speaking, if it had been the Spanish or the French who had managed to settle the majority of North America, it is incredibly likely that there would not be Native Americans or Native Canadians left to complain. Because much like they did in other areas, much like they did in Central and South America, much like they did over in Indonesia, if they came across an area that they wanted, they would simply exterminate the population. They would take some of them, of course, take the children, indoctrinate them, raise them as their own. You could take the women and breed the women into your own population. But the men would all be killed. And the culture would be exterminated. There would be no more art. There would be no more songs. There would be no more anything. But they didn't. And that is why in the U.S. and in Canada, we still have native populations here. And, you know, I don't want to get into that one too much because that, that is a whole different barrel of monkeys there. But we can go back to the ideas we discussed when it came to things like reparations, and we can explain why and how. Not only is it a unique circumstance that they're even able to be able to complain in the first place, but also why this discussion will never, ever be settled. It literally cannot be settled. There, there's no way. But that's not what I wanted to get into today. It's not the, one, it, the fact that there are still populations here left to complain that I want to talk about. It's the fact that there are others who are not here anymore because they have been exterminated. They have been removed. They have been erased from existence. And it's impossible to talk about this <clears throat> without mentioning the Nazis. Because if there was anybody who wanted to take the entire concept of cultural erasure and turn it up to 12. Even Spinal Tap's dials don't go up to 12. Hitler's did, though. They thought that they could create a perfect world if they would simply erase all of the inferior aspects of humanity. Of course, the Jews got the brunt of that, but it wasn't just the Jews. As we mentioned in our lecture on logical progression in the slippery slope. 
before Hitler even went after the Jews, before the Nazis even started their big campaigns of, you know, internment and death, they started going after the people who were deemed unfit for life. They went after first the people who had disabilities or deformities. And how did they do that? Well, they, they first, you know, went through and said, eh, if there's people who are incapable of surviving on their own, we'll just let them die. And then they moved on to simply killing people who weren't perfect. And that, of course, started people who were either mentally ill, physically deformed, or disabled, and then it expanded into anybody who didn't fit the bill of the perfect Aryan human. And then it just further expanded from there. However, let's make no mistake here. The entire point of the Nazi campaign was to erase entire swaths of people from existence. The only mistake that they really made... I mean, aside from the moral mistake of trying it in the first place, is they weren't exactly subtle about it. Everybody knew what they were doing. And people tried to turn a blind eye to it as long as they could until they literally could not anymore, and they finally told Hitler that, um, yeah, we can't stand idly by anymore. I mean, it's a gross simplification of how it went down, but... Yeah, that's kind of how it went down. Eventually, the rest of the world was forced to act, and it was all put to an end. One thing that I will say, though, and I've said it before, and I will continue to repeat it until I'm put in the ground, is that every cautionary tale is basically an instruction manual. The book 1984 was supposed to be a cautionary tale against overwhelming authoritarianism. However, some people have seemed to have taken the book 1984 and used it as a playbook. The same thing is true of A Brave New World. The same thing is true of Fahrenheit 451, among others. The fact is that if you have people who want to do these things, and there will always be people who want to do these things, the Nazis may be gone. The neo-Nazis still exist. Do you think if they didn't, or if they had a country all on their own, they wouldn't try the same thing? Of course they would. They just don't have the ability to. But as I as getting back on topic, um, all of these books, all these cautionary tales, we're supposed to take as a caution to say, these are the things you're supposed to look out for. Okay? If you see people doing these things, they're bad people. You can also flip that on its head and say, if you wanted to become an authoritarian dictator, don't do these things. People will be watching for them. Do something else. Avoid the pitfalls. That's why we don't see anybody being rounded up onto, like, uh, onto train cars anymore these days, or moved over to, you know, internment camps or anything. Yet... And we are actually still seeing that in some places like China. Nobody wants to talk about it, but I will. The Uyghur Muslims in China. They have literally been loaded onto boxcars. They have literally been sent into internment camps. They're literally being exterminated right now. And I will not let it be forgotten that Disney filmed their movie Mulan within visual range of the camps. Good job, Disney. There's a reason why you're going to be a big part of today's, today's discussion. So, if you're going to erase an entire culture from existence, if you're going to erase a people and everything about them, how do you go about it? Well, you know you can't just go through and remove all of them. It's kind of obvious. And if anybody is going to stop you, they will. The only reason that China hasn't been stopped so far is because... Nobody in the world has the character to do so. Nobody even has the character right now to condemn them for what they're doing. Much less take action. But we all acknowledge that it's going on, and we all acknowledge that it's bad, at least. 
I guess a small step is still a step. No, 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 no. If you wanted to do this and you wanted to have almost zero backlash to it, you're going to have to ease people into it. You can't just pull into a neighborhood and start loading people into a train car because people won't want to go. People will have a problem with that. You have to make it acceptable first. You have to make the idea of a people being removed okay. Then you can do it. Now, part of this is going to reference back to the last lecture we did. What was the last one we did, right? No, the one before that, where we talked about grooming and indoctrination. Because before you can actually start removing people, you're going to have to first groom your population into it. You're going to have to indoctrinate them into the idea that this is okay. And how do you do that? Well, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to go with hearts and minds. Okay, just like any, any proper military campaign, you want to get the population on your side. Now, how do you do that? Well, much as we talked about in the indoctrination and grooming lecture, you primarily want to do that through a lot of your softer vectors. You want to do that through things like media. You want to do that through things like education. Now, this is where we actually have a lot of real world examples and how I want to circle back now to what I started with, what the inspiration for this was, because the How to Train Your Dragon movie is coming out, and when I say they're changing characters, we know how they're changing the characters. They are race swapping them. Not all of them, not yet anyway, but if we're going to get started on this, why don't we take a look at what they're doing? Let me come back to OBS here real quick so I can turn this back on. This is the character of Astrid. Now, of course, if you haven't seen, um, well, if you have seen How to Train Your Dragon, you know who the characters are. If you haven't seen it, all that you need to know about it is this. How to Train Your Dragons is set in the Scandinavian part of Northern Europe. I don't know exactly what area. I don't know if they actually specify, but... The entire cast are Vikings. Which means that they're probably Danish. But I'm not positive on that. But the entire idea is that they are all Vikings. Which means that, by and large, they're all going to be blonde-haired, blue-eyed, tall. The traditional characteristics of your normal Danish person. Your normal Viking. In fact, that's what made the main character kind of stand out a bit. He was none of those. He was small. He had brown hair. He was kind of wimpy. And everybody thought that he was kind of useless. That being said, when you looked at the rest of the cast, they were all properly Danish. Or at least Scandinavian in general. Which is why we have our main character, well, not main character. Our main love interest? No, she's kind of a main character. Of Astrid. She is kind of your ideal Danish character. And of course, there's others as well. There was a pair of twins who I don't remember their names, but they don't matter. Because just furthering the example here. But now they're all being recast. And so what are we doing? Well, first off, we have the uh, main character. Do we have him here? Actually, we do. Yeah, so there's him. I forget what his name is. Oh, wait, no, it says it right there. His name is Hiccup. So, yeah, he's kind of shrimpy, brown hair, kind of short. Yeah, whatever. And then, of course, Astrid next to him. We have the characters right here. And then we have... Uh, where did my picture go? Where's the other picture? Oh, there it is. Them. Them. Do you, do you maybe notice a difference? Is, is, is there a slight difference here? There is. Because they've taken what was supposed to be one character and then they've swapped them into something else. Obviously, 
She is not the blonde-haired, blue-eyed character that we had before. Now she's being turned some variation of non-white. She has brown hair again. The eyes are different. Although, I'll be honest, when it comes to live action, you can generally not see their eyes anyway. So, don't care about the eyes. But yeah, brown hair, brown skin. Different character. Now, of course, this is not anything new. This is something that we've all been watching happen for the last decade. And trust me, there are many, many examples of this. There are so many examples of it that if you go to TV Tropes, they even have a page for it. There are so many examples of it, they have made a compendium. I, of course, they have their example there, and they talk about the various things. And this one is so expansive, actually, that they can't even put them all on one page. They had to break it down into different subcategories. Because each one of these will have its own listing. And if we just, you know, open all of them, you can see that it goes on and on and on and on. This is nothing new. It's been happening for a long time. It's actually been happening all the way back as far as we've really had media. And it's been a problem for a long time, actually, because what they're calling a race lift here used to be known as whitewashing. What would happen is that you would have a movie with somebody who was supposed to be a black character or a Mexican character or something like that, and then you would have them played by a white person. And believe it or not, this actually still goes on sometimes. And sometimes they even go so far as to use blackface to cover it up. Tropic Thunder would be a great example of that. You know, the, the movie that Robert Downey Jr. did before he got famous. I'm kidding, he was kind of famous then, he just got more famous. But whitewashing was generally agreed to be a very bad practice. Oftentimes it was done, though, because, well, Hollywood tends to be in the U.S., and the U.S. tends to be a majority white country. Sometimes they simply didn't have a, a white character or a black character to play the part. And so sometimes they didn't have any other options. That is still used today as an excuse, by the way. Sometimes they say, well, we just didn't have anybody else. But that's not true nowadays, especially now that we have things like the internet. And we can go and we can check on actors and actresses from around the world. It's not difficult to find a character or an actor or actress who can play a specific character. And we know that because, well, a, a uh, let's see... What was the character? Oh, I don't remember it now. Yep, I blanked on it. Anyway, there was a show that came out a while back. I think it was a show. It was a movie. I'm not sure. But it was supposed to be a an animated uh, show to a live-action one. And one of the problems was when they got an actress to play the uh, the character... This was not a case of gender swapping or race swapping or anything else like that. This was just one, uh, one woman who was going to play a female character. The only problem was, she did not look anything like the character. And when uh, people complained about that, she, uh, she got a little bit snippy in interviews when asked about it. Because she said, it's a cartoon character, it's unrealistic. Nobody could ever possibly play the character. That only worked so long until many cosplayers came out and said, actually, I've been playing that character for years, and I look so much better at it than you do. It was never a matter of they couldn't find anyone to play it, it's that they went for an actress 
and that was all they cared about was getting somebody to play the part. So this, this is nothing new that we're dealing with. What we have seen, however, has been an increase in it. It's always been a thing, it's always been bad, and it's always something that we should have been striving not to do. So when we agree that whitewashing or race lifting is a bad thing, we should start to see that number trending down, yes? But instead it's trending up. And if it's trending up, we can make one of, I think, two assumptions. Number one, we have screwed something up. We've made a mistake. And whatever we're doing, we're doing it wrong, and we should probably stop doing it and fix whatever problems we have created. That's our first assumption. Our first assumption is going to be negligence, ignorance. We just didn't know any better. However, if we can rule out negligence or ignorance, then we have to start assuming malice. Assumption number two. Somebody is doing it intentionally. And if somebody is doing it intentionally, then we need only ask, why? That's what I want to get into today. And I'm going to get into it with a few examples. By the way, I apologize for these examples, but you knew what you were walking into when you came in today. The first example we're going to get into is this one. Just in case you haven't seen it, or heard of it, there's a new Peter Pan out. It's called Peter Pan and Wendy. I think it's out on Disney Plus now. I don't know, I haven't watched it. I'm not going to watch it. But we're going back to the classic story of Peter Pan. Now, the classic story of Peter Pan, I do believe, dates all the way back to France? Well, date, not dates back to France. It dates back to I don't know when. But I think it originates in France. I'm not positive on that, though. It, it's European in some fashion. I know that much. And then, you know, much as every story from Europe, once Disney got a hold of it, Disney took their own take on it. And they adapted the characters in the story to make it a little bit more child-friendly because... Generally speaking, almost every single story that came out of Europe ends with the children being eaten by something. Or murdered in some grisly way. You know, back when children's stories were really children's stories. They weren't called grim for nothing. But anyway, we had the adaptation. We knew that it came from somewhere in Europe. I think it was France, but I could be wrong. Maybe it was England? Might have been England. I'm not sure. If it's England, it only, you know, further strengthens my point. But we brought it over. We brought over all the traditions in the story. We brought all of all the characters, the setting. Setting. No, it had to be England, because at the end of um, Peter Pan, they fly around the clock tower. Okay, it's England. That's right. So we brought over everything with it and tried to do an adaptation for that that would be more friendly for kids. That's fine. That's great. We're at least keeping the story the same. We're keeping the characters the same. Until they decided to redo it again. Now, reboots of Peter Pan are not short in number. There have been several cartoon versions of it. There have been several live-action versions of it. And all of them have strived to keep things as close to the original as they possibly could. Until now. Now, I bring this up because I want to cover two things specifically here. I want to cover the concept of race swapping and the concept of, of um, yeah, gender swapping in media. Because both of them are going to be important. There are other issues with Peter Pan and Wendy. This is just the first one that I wanted to cover. And of course it is Black Tinkerbell. Now, Black Tinkerbell, of course, you can see Tinkerbell is over here. I can scroll through all of the images here. And we can all see Tinkerbell in all the various iterations that she's always been. Why? 
because the character was taken directly from the story, translated from a fable to the screen, and the character Tinkerbell has always remained Tinkerbell. Until they decided that they needed to change her race. Why? Obviously, we know that they're not doing it to keep everything, you know, grounded and faithful to the original. That's out. So why do it? Did they do it to add something to the story in some way? If they did, I don't know what they added. It doesn't seem to add anything to it. It's a cosmetic change, if anything. So if you're not really adding anything, either substantive or stylized, to the the um, the adaptation, why do it? I mean, it's a fair question, and if you don't have an answer, that's okay. Most people don't have an answer right now. Because it doesn't really make sense. The next one is going to be the same question. This movie is still in theaters right now, and it is bombing hard. It's bombing hard because people don't want it. Again, we have The Little Mermaid. This one I do know. Um, this story came out of Norway. So again, we're talking about a Scandinavian story, which of course Disney then tried to, um, tried to adapt. They did change the setting a little bit. I believe that the story of The Little Mermaid takes place somewhere in the French area, kinda. But I'm not positive on that one. But still, they kept it at least in Europe. The new Little Mermaid has been moved down into the Caribbean. Somewhere around the Haiti area, I think. Maybe Dominican Republic? I'm not sure. I think it's Haiti, though. And, of course, they went through and changed a lot of the cast. They changed a lot of the cast to make them black instead of white. They changed a lot of other things, too. Like, Flounder is no longer a Flounder, I don't think. Um, they changed the gender and the species of the bird. So, I mean, when, when we're talking about... Um, Things like gender swaps and things, uh, things like that. Yeah, that that's a thing that happened. Why did they have to change the gender of the bird? I don't know, but they did. But we have here another example. Now, what did it do besides piss a lot of people off? Didn't really add anything to it. Ostensibly, it was done to add representation to the movie. They said that people needed to see more black characters on the film. And, of course, a really, really uh, common response to that is, why? The idea about representation being needed, I think has been, it's always been, and it remains to be a very shallow argument. This idea that you need to see somebody like yourself in a movie. The problem with the idea of needing representation in films and TV shows and everything else is that it boils down to a physical representation. There's a, a saying. What was it? Um, I think it was... Um, small minds discuss people. Medium minds discuss things and big minds discuss ideas, or something close to that. The idea being that if all you care about is something physical, something tangible, or just something in front of you, you're not using enough of your brain. If you are looking at a character and it's a different race from you, or it's a different gender from you, and you cannot find something to identify with it. Perhaps the problem is on you, not necessarily the media that you're working with. And while I understand that that argument could also be turned around against my argument, I have a caveat to that that we're going to get to later. 
The other example that I had here, of course, was Astrid from How to Train Your Dragon, but we've discussed that already. And so I won't go into that again. The next thing I want to get into was, as I said, in The Little Mermaid, not only did they change The Little Mermaid herself, they also changed the bird. Why did they change the bird? What was wrong with the bird? The bird, and I cannot remember his name. No, wait, yes, I can. His name was Scuttle. Scuttle was basically just the, um, the tie that Ariel had to the dry world. Because he's a bird, he knows the things that go on on land, because he can fly over land. He knows the things that happens on boats. He knows about humans. Not as much as he thinks he knows, but he knows some. And so his entire purpose in the movie was to just kind of be there as a friend to Ariel, to be kind of a mentor figure, even if it was a mistaken mentor, and to give her, really, the wrong guidance. That that was kind of his entire point in the, in the, the thing. But now he's been turned into a different bird. I don't remember what kind of bird. Somebody told me, but I've forgotten. And he's now a she. Why? I don't know. But again, thank you TV Tropes, because just like there was a, um, a page just for race lifting, we also have a page for gender flips. And of course they have their example up here. Left is ghost in the comics, and then right ghost in the cinematic universe. What cinematic universe? I don't know. I don't know who this character is. But... There we go. And again, gender flipping, we already know what it is. We don't need a huge discussion, but they have, of course, a massive compendium of case after case after case. Just going through all the different instances of race flipping. Now, again, race flipping is not something that is generally new. It's happened before. But much like... Um, much like whitewashing, we tended to agree that it was bad and that we shouldn't do it. Again, we should see a trend downwards from this. But instead, we find a trend going upwards instead. Why? I don't know. I have a few ideas. We'll get to those in a minute. But just as a few examples... The Dune movie just came out uh, last year. No, two years ago. I guess it didn't just come out. I still haven't seen it yet, and I'm not going to either. Mostly because of things like this. They took a character who was very important in the books, because I did read the Dune books, and I love the Dune books. They're very good. A prominent character, of course, was Liet. Now, who is Liet in the books? Well... If you're not familiar with the story of Dune, I will make this very, very short for you. The entire story of Dune is that you have four primary houses who are fighting over one planet called Dune. Why? Dune has spice on it, and we need spice for everything. We need it for space travel, we need it for healthcare, we need it for a lot of things. We need spice for everything. And all four houses want control of this planet, to the point where they will kill you for it. And so the planet transfers hands back and forth many, many times. Eventually, however, two of the houses agree that they're going to link up and they're going to conspire to get rid of another house. And so they, uh, they cede the planet to the other house. Let them take control of it so that they can come back, kill everybody, and take over the planet again after wiping their house out. Now, why is this important? Because this guy, this guy right here, Lee at Keynes, Kynes? I think it's Keynes, actually. He is a planetologist or something like that. The entire thing about him being there is that he has been studying the planet for a very, very long time to the point where he is going to be their advisor not only is he very knowledgeable on how the planet works, 
he is actually secretly in with the native population here. The native population who are very militant, very xenophobic, uh, very traditional, and very strict. He had to work very hard to get into their good graces, and he was only he's only barely tolerated within them. They respect him enough that they allow him to work with them, to know about them. And that's about the extent of it. And he can blend in with them. He can look like any other Fremen on the planet. So what did they do? Well, they took the character, who uh, was very important to the story, and they swapped both his race and his gender. They turned him into a woman, which women in the Fremen are generally not... They're generally not used as, as fighters or anything, but he's supposed to be a fighter. That is not to say that women can't fight. They can. And any Fremen women, woman is generally regarded as being a league stronger than outsider men. But the women are still supposed to take care of the holdings. So they turned him into a woman, who is now, of course, a badass combat woman. They changed the race because... Well, we don't really have a reason for that. They just had to do it. And so he got both treatments. Another example, and this one's a little bit personal to me... Lost in Space. I love Lost in Space. Lost in Space is great. I mean, I never, I don't care too much for like, you know, cheesy, um, cheesy 1960s and 1970s sci-fi, but I, Lost in Space always had kind of a special place in my heart. And of course, I had to go through and race swap, or uh, not race swap, but gender swap there as well. This is the best picture I could find, but of course, here we have Dr. Smith from the original. And then we have the new Doctor from the new movie. And we have other pictures of him as well. He was, of course, the bad guy. Which actually makes this a rare villainous example, because... Generally speaking, women aren't allowed to be bad guys. But they went ahead and they changed that, too. And really, it doesn't add anything to it. It doesn't add or really detract from it, but it does beg the question of... Why? Why, why would you do this? I don't know. Another example, very close to my heart, is from an animated series. Voltron. Now, much like Transformers, I grew up in the heyday of Voltron. I, I, re I remember watching Voltron on Saturday mornings. And I love giant robots, so Voltron was totally my jam. And I'm going to be honest with you. Even though this is a change, it's not a change that I'm terribly upset with. But just because I'm not upset with it doesn't mean that it's not a thing that needs to be called out. Because it does need to be. They took a character who was male in the original cartoon, and they turned it female in the new version. The question is why? And the only real reason we can get asked for why is so they could have a big reveal in the middle of the show. Because, of course, the character is played as male from the very beginning until eventually they reveal later on that the character was actually a girl. And they did it expense at the expense of one of the male characters who was treated as an idiot for not knowing all along. If we look at this picture... This is the after, this is the before. Again, I still like the show. I think the show is great, but they still did it. And for that matter, they even went further than that. They didn't race swap any of the characters, as far as I know. I had limited time to do research on this, so mm, I might be missing some things. But they also went through and changed the sexualities of the characters. 
specifically the main character. And while I, I don't really have a problem with, you know, a gay character being in the show, why did it have to be changed? Again, you can add new characters, you can tell new stories, but stop changing everything to make it fit. Because what are you doing when you do that? Well, again, people say it's for representation. They say that we need to have representation of these things in here. Okay, let's go with that. You need to have representation, okay? So you need to have representation for black care or for black people. All right. So you go through and you take the white character and you turn the white character black. You now have another black character. You also no longer have a white character there. You haven't added anything so much as you've swapped it. You have taken something away. You have taken away the white character to get a black one. Now, since we're going to argue about representation, what about the white characters or the white people's representation? Do they not deserve to have this as well? And this is a common argument that you hear in things like white supremacist groups. They love to use this argument by saying that they're trying to go through and remove, you know, white representation from all these things. Of course, we generally dismiss them because, well, these are white supremacist extremist groups. And while the groups themselves are bad, they're not entirely wrong. See, the white supremacist groups would much rather see things taken in the far extreme other direction. They would like to see all of the, you know, minority characters removed from media. That's their ultimate goal. However, it does seem to be that we have the opposite thing going on right now. See, it's not enough to add a black character to something, or to add a female character, or to add a gay character to these things. It's that they have to be replacing something else. There's a reason why, when The Little Mermaid came out, people got upset. It wasn't because there was a Black Mermaid primarily, though. It was because they had taken away the original character. They had taken away the original Ariel and replaced it with this. This is not this. This is not this. These two things are not comparable. So why did they do it? People said that, you know, we deserve to have a Black Mermaid on the screen, and that's fine. I'll even go so far as to agree with them. However, the way they went about doing it was wrong. And an, a great example that I saw once, let me see if I can find it. Let me do a quick little search here. Actually, I think that I can do it this way. Hold on. Still learning how to do these things. I believe it was a snippet from the animated series from The Little Mermaid. Let's see if I can find it. Yes, there we go. And then I should be able to slide this over here. Yes. Yes, I can put it right there. And now we have some clips from the original animated cartoon. Here we have Ariel. And this was a black mermaid that they met in one of the episodes. I have no idea. But this was brought up as a, as a uh, point of contention, saying that you didn't need to change Ariel to get a Black Mermaid. You could have made an entire movie about her. Not only would it have 
satisfied the goals that they were going for, but it would have further expanded the entire Little Mermaid universe. They could have made her the main character, they could have even had some kind of cameo by the original Ariel, much as Ariel went to her part of the ocean to meet her, she could come and visit Ariel's part of the ocean. Maybe even put the two of them together to go on an adventure somewhere. It could have been done. It was intentionally chosen, though, not to. And again, now that we're getting into intention, we must ask why. The same thing is also true when we talked about Tinkerbell. Because if we look down here into this image, we have had many, many different iterations of the fairies from Peter Pan. And here alone, I don't know what this is from, it says a video from 2008, but we have a vast diversity of the fairies here. If you wanted to use one of them, it could have, you could have used any one of these. And for that matter, if, because Peter Pan is a lost boy, if you wanted to have a story with one of these, why could not all of these fairies found their own Lost Boy? Maybe not even one of the Lost Boys that we've seen. Maybe a new one. And they could have done an entirely new story with that. Again, creating a new story with new characters and expanding upon what they already have instead of what they're really doing, and that is replacing. And that's the, the crux of this entire discussion today. Because I wanted to talk about cultural erasure. And the reason that I had to go through and use all of this to set a foundation is because this is what they are trying to do. They're trying to erase an entire culture. Now, we've, we've seen things like this for a long time. We have seen... Racial extremists, we have seen gender extremists, we've seen activists who have said things like, we need to exterminate the right way, the white race. These people are given absolutely no credence because these people are crazy, and although I will go ahead and take them at their word, and assume that they're absolutely genuine in what they say, there is no way that they could pull it off. If they were to go out and try to do it themselves, they would be arrested for murder. If they tried to round people up into boxcars or box trucks or whatever and ship them off to camp, we would arrest them for false imprisonment. Because it's culturally, currently, unacceptable. But remember what I said about the need to groom your population. The need to indoctrinate them. You have to first make people okay with it. Then you can do it. Now, the Nazis did have a, a handle on this. Of course, they had vast amounts of propaganda and such. Most of it didn't really work because most of it was silly. Talk about how, you know, the Jews spread disease and such. Nobody really bought that. A few people bought it, but not many. They were a vast minority. That's why nothing happened until the Nazis really took power. And then they could order people to do it. They could order their own regiments of police and soldiers to do these things. They didn't have the general populace on their side. Nowadays, we know that we can't just go out and do it. We need the populace on our side. And that's where this comes in. Remember how I said that every single one of these cautionary tales is basically an instruction manual. People will learn from history. And they have. There we go. The idea behind swapping all these things out and replacing all these characters is that you want to erase the group that you're, you're trying to get rid of from the mind of most people. The idea is this. If you were to go and say you want to round up, well, let's just go ahead and jump into it. If you wanted to round up all the white people, you're going to have a really hard time doing that because you don't have enough people who are on your side to do it. A lot of people are going to say that you're wrong to do it, 
and they're going to be reminded of that every time they look around. Okay? The majority of the U.S., the majority of Canada, is white. The majority of most of your European countries are white. It's going to be really hard for you to turn the population against itself. But there will always be people there that are easily swayed. And, as we have seen, there are many people who are white, who are explicitly anti-white. It's a bizarre phenomenon, but it's right there. It, 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 it's a thing. It happens. But there's not enough of them. Not yet. So how do you get more of them? Well, the first thing you have to do is you have to take away anything that they have to be proud of. Take away anything that they have to like. That is to say, you have to remove all of their heroes. They should have nothing to aspire to first. They should have no good role models. They should have no good characters at all, really. Anybody who is honorable, who is aspirational, anybody who has something of value should not be white and instead should be literally anything else. This is the first step that you take to demoralizing a population. You take away their heroes. Why? Because their heroes stand up for certain values and certain principles. Before you can get to the underlying values and principles, you have to get rid of the people who are standing up for them. So what do you do? You erase their characters from fantasy. You burn their books or rewrite their books. You hide or destroy their statues. You begin by erasing the parts of their culture that are the foundational pillars of their culture. Make sure that they have nothing to refer back to. Once you've done that, the rest is actually just a matter of time. But this, of course, is the longest step. You have to go through and you have to make sure that you've erased all of it. So today, we have the Little Mermaid, and Ariel is black. Okay, that's fine. I mean, they, they only changed one character in it today. Until the next version comes out, in which case they'll have more. And it wasn't just Ariel. Several of the sisters were black. I believe in the original, several of them were black as well. But now we have more. It's tiptoeing. It's not doing it all at once. It's just one little step at a time. The next time it comes out, maybe because of the backlash for the live-action Little Mermaid, they decide to redo it. And they'll redo it with some fantastic CGI. I mean, like, they'll, they'll get the crew from, say, Zootopia. I thought Zootopia was great. As much as I hate Disney, I would have to see Zootopia too. I, I, I couldn't stop myself. But what if you get those people to come back and do the new Little Mermaid? Okay, we're going to go back to doing it animated, except this time, King Triton and the rest of the sisters will be back. It'll be an entire black family of mermaids. Or maybe they change Prince Eric this time. It's just little steps like that, and all they need is just one excuse to take one more little step along the way. Until eventually they can simply say, there, there's, no more, um, there's no more white people in it. The Little Mermaid is now officially a black story. And just like that, you have taken away one of those pillars. And they can do this with any movie they want. And they are doing it very slowly with every piece of media they have. A lot of people question, why is it that we're not getting new things these days? Why do we not get new movies? Why do we not get new TV shows? Why is everything a reboot or a rehash or a reimagining? It's not necessarily because they can't come up with anything new. There are people out there who have new ideas. It's not explicitly because studios are just afraid of taking chances. Although that is a big part of it. Studios are very much anti-innovation. But another big part of it is because they're not necessarily unable to make new things. It's they want to get rid of 
the old things. Again, I made reference to, um, to books like 1984 when I said that these things are not supposed to be an instruction manual. They're supposed to be a cautionary tale. But what was the, uh, the motto in 1984 from Ingsoc? He who controls the present controls the past. He who controls the past controls the future. Now, in 1984, that's because they had gone, or they go through and they alter all of their books. They alter all of their newspapers. The Ministry of Truth is tasked with rewriting the history on a day-to-day -day basis to make sure that the past always agrees with the present. And by doing so, they can lead into a new future. We see the same thing now in things like the Disney Corporation, who are actively going back and rewriting their own history. Now, unfortunately, they don't have enough control yet to simply remove everything. That isn't, to, that isn't to say they might not try. Many people have not heard of the Disney movie Song of the South. Song of the South is the first movie that Disney produced. And the reason why most people have not heard of the movie Song of the South is because it does not exist anymore. What happened was that Song of the South came out and it was very popular. Had good songs, had good animation, very nice movie. However, as time went on, some of those things were viewed as racist. And Disney did not want to be associated with anything racist. So Disney launched one of the greatest undercover campaigns ever to be pulled off by a corporation in human history. What Disney did is they went out and they found every single copy of the Song of the South. They literally, as computer technology um, grew in power and scope, they had computers that were built to scour the internet looking for copies of Song of the South if they should pop up on a place like eBay. So they could instantly buy it up only to hide it in a vault somewhere. Now, there are still copies of the Song of the South out there. They're very few. They're very rare. They're almost non-existent. But they do still exist. However, there will never be another one. And the more these they, that they see come into, um, into the public, every single one they can get their hands on, they make disappear. And just like that, a piece of Disney's history, gone. Because they didn't want it to be there anymore. They didn't want to be associated with it, and they did not want that to carry into their future. Now, with the rest of their catalog, that's a lot harder. Especially when it comes to all of their Disney classics. We're talking Snow White, Cinderella, Peter Pan, uh, Beauty and the Beast, things like that. These things are a lot harder because they have been distributed much, much further. And, um... This is also why there's been a big push for things like streaming, I think. One of the things that people have, have cautioned when it comes to streaming is the fact that when things are streamed, whether it be an ebook on a Kindle, whether it be a television show on Netflix, whether it be a movie on Disney+. Plus. If you don't own it, if you don't have a physical copy of it, then it can be altered or removed at any time. Now, we saw this in particular with um, books like Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn. Now, because I'm on YouTube, I can't actually quote what was in those books, because that would be a quick way to get my channel banned. But places like Amazon actually went in and edited those books. 
they changed the books to make them more acceptable to a modern audience. And most people had no idea that it happened until it was leaked. And then people were very angry about it. However, even though they might have been angry about it, there was nothing that could be done about it. The changes were made. Now, of course, every normal book, every, every printed copy of Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn cannot be changed. But there's also a, dwin a, a well, not a dwindling number, but a falling number of them. As books are lost or books are destroyed, they will, you know, simply cease to exist eventually. I don't believe they're in print anymore. I could be wrong about that, but I think they stopped printing them. Or, if they are printing them still, they're printing edited versions of them. They've done this with many uh, such books. They're trying to simply erase the history that they don't like. I say this in the context of the conversation that we're having now because the more they're able to replace these things and the more the older versions can dwindle out of existence, sooner or later, they simply won't exist at all. When I talk about playing the long game here, we're talking about several generations. We're potentially talking hundreds of years to make this happen. But it is happening. As we pointed out, or as I pointed out, um, when they start replacing these characters, and they start taking away these characters from a certain group of people, saying that you shouldn't be proud of these things. These things don't belong to you anymore. This doesn't belong to you. The entire work doesn't belong to you anymore. You shouldn't enjoy this. Maybe you shouldn't watch this. Maybe you shouldn't even have it. Uh, something that sticks out to, in my mind is when... Um, Black Panther came out, or maybe it was Black Panther 2, I forget which one it was. You actually had black activists who came out and said that the movie was not for white people. And that no white person should ever go see it in theaters. White people can wait until it comes out on video or D, you know, DVD or streaming or something. You can go see it at home. But the theater experience, that was for the black people. These people exist. Again, they're a vast minority now. But these things can grow. So eventually, if they can tell you that Black Panther, just because it is a movie almost exclusively of black people, is not for whites, then what happens when they can turn a Disney movie almost entirely into black people? Just recently, there came out in a... a uh, it was a video on, on YouTube, actually. And I wonder if I can find that real quick. I know who did it, so let's see. Can I find it? Ah, yes, here we go. Now, can I do this without making a whole bunch of noise? Yes, I can. So if I bring this over to this window, just like that, and then turn Chrome back on, I need to get myself some kind of stream deck or whatever so I can start changing this stuff myself with just a button push. But this was from Clownfish TV. I saw it yesterday. I don't generally watch them, but I had to. The entire thing that they brought up here was a tweet that was made by somebody. They take they had taken a um a scene from the new Little Mermaid movie and they had redrawn it in the older style. And this of course made some people very angry. I wonder if they have a um if they have a picture of the scene in question. Do they? Wait, was that it? No, that was not it. Did they have it? Maybe not. Oh, wait, no, there it is. 
Yeah. So there's the scene in question from The Little Mermaid that they wanted to copy. I guess that's her laying in a bunch of jellyfish? I guess mermaids are immune to jellyfish. Ariel is half sea turtle? I guess. But they had wanted to redraw it, and so they did it in the old animated style, and it caused some people discomfort. Because they, they came back and they said that you can't do that. The question, of course, is why? I mean, after all, if they can do a movie with Ariel being black, why can you not redraw a scene from the movie with Ariel being white? And this, I think, is an absolutely wonderful point to answer that why question. Why is it that they insist on race swapping all of the white characters out? And why is it such a bad thing to bring the white characters into it in some way? When you take everything as a whole, when you look at every single facet of it, when you look at all of the examples, when you take all of the arguments in, you come down to a single answer. There is a large group of people, a powerful group of people, people of influence, people of means, who want to get rid of white people. Now, why do they want to get rid of white people? That is something that I cannot answer. I can make an assumption. <clears throat> My assumption is they're racist, just like every single other group in history. Every single group in history that, that took a look at one culture and said, yep, you know what? I don't, I don't like that culture. I think it shouldn't exist anymore. Yeah, they did it because they were racist. And I think that's what we're seeing now. We fought so hard against racism by the whites that we turned a blind eye to racism against the whites. And now what they're trying to do is they're trying to go all the way to the other end of that pond and say no more of them. Which is why things like this are a problem. They managed to finally get rid of one. And now they're angry because somebody tried to bring it back. Now, this is just fan art. At the end of the day, this has almost no cultural influence at all. The fact is, these guys covered it, this, the, uh, the Clownfish TV guys, and they have 312,000 subscribers. I'm talking about it too, and I have 330. And, you know, two people in my chat. Probably the only two people who will even hear this discussion. So, you know, thumbs up to you guys. I'm glad you're here. But that's probably all the exposure this person's really getting. Culturally, they're insignificant. And the end result of this will be that the Little Mermaid will from now on be black. They've succeeded in getting rid of another white character. We've seen them do it in other stories, and they're going to continue doing it in many more. Again, while I cannot expressly ascertain their, their motivations for doing so, I can at least confidently say that their main goal, their primary purpose, is to eliminate white people from media. And why? Well... It's for the same argument that they give. See, the reason they say that we need to have all of these, uh, these black characters in, in all media is because they say that, you know, black erasure is, is black death. Black people need to be able to see themselves on screen. They need to be affirmed that they exist and that they deserve to exist. Okay, I'll give you that one. I think it's a bad argument, but I'm going to give them the argument. Okay, I'm going to be generous here and just say, fine, you win. If that's the case, and if black people need to be able to see black people on screen for, you know, them to continue to exist, then what happens if you can wipe out all the white people on screen? 
Well, by their own argument and by their own logic, then that means that white people don't deserve to exist. And so for every movie you see where they are consistently promoting the need to have a diverse or comp a, yeah, well, a diverse, in this case, meaning either one race or maybe two races, or generally just diverse in being no whites at all, we see where it's going. Of course, we are just talking about media here. But here's the thing. Remember how we talked about logical progression, okay? If you can remove an entire race from media, that is a foot in the door. Because now if you can remove an entire race of people from media, what else can you remove them for? After all, we have civil rights protections, but they don't seem to be working anymore. If you can turn somebody down for an acting role because of their race, can you also start turning people down for, say, set work because of their race? I mean, it's not enough to have diversity on the screen. You might also need to have diversity behind the screen. Right? I mean, that just makes sense. So in the name of diversity, we'll need to stop certain people from getting a job behind the camera or behind the set or in costuming or whatever. It's just one more step. And if we can stop people from, you know, doing set work, then maybe we can stop people of a certain race from doing contract work because most set work is contract work. You contract with a certain set design team, you contract with a certain tailoring team, those are all contract work, and if you can bar them, then you can bar an entire race from doing the same thing with, say, any contract work. So they don't have to work with anyone who is, you know, a certain race. They can just exclude them. And if you can exclude people from contract work, what about non-contract work? What about just simple jobs entirely? What, 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 if we, what if you could just exclude people from getting any job somewhere? What if you don't want a certain race working at McDonald's? Or a certain race working at Target? I mean, Target's in the news a lot lately. It's a good one to use. And Tuck says, Discrimination on race for actors does make sense, especially if changing a skin color with makeup is not allowed. Ah, yes, you make a good point there. However, your point is hollow for the sheer reason that they are changing characters even when they don't need to. They can take a white character and make them black, even when it doesn't make sense. So if they can discriminate even when it doesn't make sense then they, they can not discriminate when it does make sense, if you get what I mean. So the fact is that this is just one stepping stone along the way until they can just stop a certain group of people from working at all. And that might seem like it's a far stretch, but again, these are small steps. They're baby steps in one direction. We cannot jump from A to Q, much less Z. But we can take one step from A to B, and then B to C, and C to D. Each one little step along the way. The same thing is also true when we talked about gender swapping. Because again, we've seen a similar tick up when it comes to gender swapping as well. Why is that? Well, I don't think it's that much of a stretch to realize that most of Hollywood, and most of media in general, even if it's outside of Hollywood, has been expressly feminist for as long as feminism has been around. After all, you have people there with a large mouthpiece 
many or a lot of money, a lot of power, a lot of influence, the ability to go out and, and affect change. And so they love to take up activist arguments. And so when feminism was really getting going, one of the first places that it went to was Hollywood. Now, to be fair, to be absolutely fair, if there was one place where feminism was needed, it was in Hollywood. Because where, while women may not have had all the same rights everywhere, or where they might have been lagging behind in some places, it was in Hollywood where women were, and let's face it, continue to be very much abused and oppressed in Hollywood. Because that is the one place where they still think that they can take women, actors, and tell them exactly what they have to do, both on and off the set. So, yeah, if there was any one place that was going to be, that it needed it, it was there. However, from there, those that were successful in promoting this, they were able to take their message far and wide. And the end result of that is that many of those that were there and were abused and harmed, well, they decided they wanted to get revenge. Now, while I can understand their need for revenge, it doesn't change what's been going on lately. Because there has been a, a great push to take men and put men in their place. We have seen this in media. We've seen it in education. We've seen it even in places like the military and in politics. There's been a large push to put men down. See, originally feminism was supposed to be about raising all women up. Women needed to be lifted up. Women needed to be recognized as equals to men. They needed to have the same rights as men. They needed to have the same opportunities as men. And they got it. And Tuck says, wait, you're saying Weinstein wasn't the only one? I are surprised. I are too, Tux. I are too. But anyway, feminism was supposed to raise up all women, to give women everything that they were owed. Except that some people decided that everything that women was owed also included a chance to do the same thing. Much as when we talked about reparations and retaliation and retribution and revenge, I stated that the entire argument over black reparations yeah, black reparations comes down to one thing. There are no reparations. There can be no reparations. Because blacks were enslaved. They were captured. They were brought across an ocean with like a 10% chance of living. Then they were worked to the bone. And many of them died on plantations. There is nothing that you can do to make reparations for that. There is no amount of money that you can do to make reparations for that. The only thing that you could possibly do, the only revenge that could possibly be gained, would be for black people to enslave whites for an equal amount of time with an equal amount of viciousness. That would be the only true equality. I do believe that is basically the code of Hammurabi. An eye for an eye. And of course, as they say, an eye for an eye would leave the whole world blind. My retort to that is, I only have one eye and I didn't do anything wrong. So this entire system doesn't work as it is. But that's beside the point. That's just me being petty. The same thing is true here. Women have been oppressed in history. I'm not going to say that they haven't been. And I'm not going to not going to say that, you know, they they didn't deserve some of it. I know, hot take. But the fact is that women were traditionally not warriors. Women were traditionally not hunters. 
they were traditionally not builders. And so somebody had to do it. That meant that either men had to do all of the fighting, all the hunting, all the building, and take care of everything back home, or men will do what men are good at doing, and the women should take care of everything else. While the men make sure that, you know, there's food. There was a certain order to things, and there was a reason and a logic to it. That doesn't mean you had to be happy with it. That doesn't mean that you have to think that it was good. All that's important is that there was a reason for it. It wasn't capricious. But now, where do we find ourselves? Well, we find ourselves in a place where, much like in the previous discussion, women have been given pretty much everything. Women now have equal rights. They have equal pay. The entire idea of the pay gap is a myth. And I will go on record with everybody else saying that it is a myth. The entire reason why women don't earn as much as men is because women have been conditioned not to ask for it. They have been told to go along to get along instead of being confrontational. Men are taught from a young age to be confrontational. Or at least they had been until now. Women have been given everything that they ever wanted for the most part because the one thing that they have not been given is revenge. Because much like when we talk about um, slavery and revenge for that, there are many women who say the only answer to what they view as previous oppression is going to be to oppress men in an equal and opposite manner. That is to say, to create an underclass which they alone can control and rule over. They want to be able to restrict men's movements. They want to be able to demand men's activities. They want to be able to use men for literally anything they want with neither restraint nor repercussion. And they want to do so for an equal amount of time, or perhaps an exceeding amount of time, than men had. Because the thing about uh, revenge is that revenge is not measured. So there's no need to stop at an equal amount of time. Now, obviously, this is even less likely to work than the idea of, you know, racial equality or cultural erasure. But the fact is that they're still out there trying to do it. And how are they trying to do it? Well, again, much as we said the first time, the first thing they have to do is they have to remove any heroes, any icons, anything that promotes what they view as being the dreaded toxic masculinity. And so they need to tear down all of the heroes. They need to tear down all the philosophers. They need to tear down every single man who is someone that a boy could aspire to. But not just that. They try to replace them. The idea being that if you could take an aspirational man and simply swap it out with a woman, would you not get a woman that a boy could look up to and thus you would have a better role model for that boy? Of course, it's an insane idea, but it's not one that they're not trying to do. And even if they don't get a female character that boys will aspire to, they can at least take away the strong male role model that they might have. And Tuck says, I believe that line of thought, women are oppressed, can only be attained if you minimize the value to society from raising and educating children, along with creating much of culture and society. That is a fair point. Although, I will say this. Raising and educating children is not a woman's job. That is in everyone's job. Because it takes both parents, and yes, I will say both parents, men and women, to properly raise a child. 
and creating culture and society, again, that's both. Women don't create culture and society. Men don't create culture and society. They do it together. The only difference is that men tend to do the more physical things. Women tend to do the more intellectual things. And it's not that men are incapable of doing intellectual things. It's just that women tend to be less good at doing the physical things. Yes, a woman can hunt. But when we're talking about the pre-gunpowder age, a woman was far less capable of drawing back a 60-pound bow. A woman was also far less capable of throwing a spear or a pilum or something else with sufficient force to get a heart shot on, say, a deer, which has to go through skin, muscle, and a rib cage. Women were simply less capable of doing these things, so they did what they were good at. Just like, you know, the man did what he was good at. Do you think many of the men wanted to be out in the cold and the snow and everything else tracking down game when they could be home, warm, in front of a fire? No. But they were best suited to do it. Tuck says, yes, the one staying at home does carry a significant portion of the load. And I'd say it's more of a social and cultural, or it's more social and cultural things. I'm not going to say a significant portion of the load so much as I'm going to say half the load. Everything was pretty much divided as equally as it possibly could be. I mean, after all, if things were not divided as equally as they could be, then, uh... Well, one would be, one or the other would be helping with the other. I mean, if the man cannot hunt and clean and everything else game, then somebody's going to have to pick up the slack. That means that maybe he spends all of his time out hunting and she has to take care of cleaning the carcasses. Then again, if the man has got plenty of carcasses, and they're all cleaned and ready, guess who helps out around the house? It was always equal. It's just we had different people who were taking care of different things. But now we've gone so far in the other direction where where people are looking to say, no, we, when, when we look at, say, you know, history, we say women weren't allowed to do these things. It's like, well, no, they kind of were. But... We didn't really allow them to because there were people who could do it better. And if you didn't do the job well enough back then, you died. There was no reason to send out your most mediocre hunter when not bringing home game meant that you didn't have anything to eat. And yes, uh, the man should spend more uh, time educating the children as well. Yes, Tux, you're right, and they did. After all, children, at least, you know, pre before we had schools, were educated much differently. Because children would generally only stay home with their mother until they were old enough to start doing things. Then they would be put to work. And that work would involve either helping out their parents with the various tasks, or they would be helping out different other parents. For example, a young child might be used for gathering firewood. Not big logs, but a young child might be sent out into the wood to pick up kindling and small logs. That was their education. They would be shown what to look for, and they would be shown the surrounding area. They would learn how to track, they would learn trails, they would learn signs. The education was done by both parents, usually according to whatever they would be expected to do when they got old enough, which again was divided up by what are men good at and what are women good at. We don't really have that anymore because in the modern era, pretty much anybody can do anything. 
I mean, a woman with a hunting rifle is perfectly capable of hunting as any man is. There's no need to have a, a person who can pull back a 60-pound bow. But, I mean, anybody can pull a trigger. That's kind of my, my feeling about women in the military, too. I actually really have no problem with women in the military, mostly because if you give a woman a rifle, a woman is pretty much as deadly as any other man with a rifle. Bullets don't care about gender. Now, there are some other things that can be argued, things like carrying capacity and, and things like that. I don't want to get into that. My point is not that women have been separated from society. And, uh, let's see. Tuck says we might actually be disagreeing on this one. The man simply cannot be at home while hunting, warring, etc. The woman could for most of her duties, though not 100%. You can continue on this, though. Well, thank you for that permission. Uh, we don't need to dwell on this. It's a tangent. It is a tangent, but tangents are what I do best. And I'm actually kind of running out of time here anyway. I have kind of a hard cut off at about noon. But, point is, they are going about and they are removing men from these aspirational roles where they can show boys and other young men what should you aspire to, what morals, principles, values should you be holding. And they're either removing the roles entirely, or they are changing it to be a woman's position instead. And the answer to that, of course, is why? What does that do? What does that gain? And in this case, what does it gain? It gains a person of greater stature and significance for women. And it takes away that from men. Now... This is less perfect than the idea of race swapping because when we go back to like the roles that women like to play, you can take a character like, say, Rambo, okay? Who is more manly than Rambo, okay? Trudging through the Vietnam jungle, killing Viet Cong, setting traps, everything else. He survives on his own. He knows how to track. He knows how to hunt. He's strong. He's self-reliant. He's everything else. What if you take a character like Rambo and make him into a woman then? Well, you still have all the same characteristics. And now you've taken away someone for boys to look up to. But are girls going to look up to this? Well, we've had a long time to study this, and the answer is no. They don't. They don't care. They don't want it. They don't even like it. So they're not really gaining anything, meaning that this is entirely a hostile and harmful action being taken. And it's being taken for one reason. They want to punish men for what they see as being toxically men. They don't want anyone to aspire to this level. They don't want anyone to achieve at this level. And the reason for that is simple. If they can get enough men to stop achieving, and if they can get women to continue to achieve, then the end result is they will get the society they want. They will be able to assert enough influence and enough political and economic control that they will simply be able to change laws, to change policies, and all of these things to turn the men around them into a subservient class. A class that is powerless against them. A class that is afraid and subservient to them. A class that they can use, abuse, and discard without any fear of repercussion or reprimand. And they're working on getting it. I mean, we have all seen how men in modern times are extremely disinclined to act in any way that would be seen as traditionally masculine. Whether that is standing up for themselves, whether that's standing up for anyone around them, and the reason is not hard to see. We can take from the recent news the case out of New York, the subway arrest that turned into a death 
where a group of men saw another man who was threatening people in a subway car. They engaged him and subdued him, and the man died. Well, what's happened since then? There have been uh, many other incidences on subway cars or in subway stations. I believe it was last week that I had brought up a, the case of a man who walked up to a woman, grabbed her head, and just slammed her head into an oncoming subway car. And nobody stopped him. Nobody even lifted a finger. Why? Because people have been trained not to. They have been taught that any action you take that might be hostile in some way, or violent in some way, or, let's just, let, let, let's just be honest here, any way that might be considered masculine will be punished. And so what happened? Well, she, uh, she ended up a quadriplegic. And the other guy, I think they caught him later, but he walked out of the station. They didn't catch him until much later. And they caught him because there were witnesses. People did tell the police what to look for. But nobody was willing to do anything about it. So all these people have had their, their role models taken away from them. They've been told that if you act out in a certain way, you will be punished for it. And the end result is that, well, we now have a subservient population. The downside of that, of course, is that people are now getting exactly what they asked for. We have a subservient population, and who's suffering for it? Not going to answer that question. You know the answer to that question. But they still want to do it. And they're still making progress on that. And so the end result to all of this, even though we say that it's just a cartoon, it's just a movie, it's just a fictional character. These are always the first step. It's the toe in the door that lets you take every further step in through the door until you can get to the point where you wanted to go. The ultimate end goal to all of it, which is that you can take an entire culture or an entire segment of your population and you can either reduce it into a servile faction underneath you or you can eradicate it from your culture entirely so that you no longer have to deal with it. And that is why all of this is so very, very important. Because if we let the toe in the door, and ostensibly the toe is already in the door, everything else is free to follow. It is much, much harder to get it back out, to push it back out, once it's in. As we saw with the, the instance of the Little Mermaid, when somebody tried to repaint it in the original Disney fashion, what do we see then? We see hostility. We see attacks. Why? Because they were finally making progress, and you're trying to fight back. They don't want you to fight back. They don't want to have any kind of competition, and they do not want anyone to say no. This is why it is so important to say no, and why the most important thing you may ever do in your life is say no. No is a powerful word, and it's one that is not used often enough. A no, with no qualifiers, with no excuses, with no apologies. You don't need to explain why you're saying no. You don't need to justify yourself if you know that you're right. You just say no. And that's what we have to start doing. We don't necessarily have to push everything all the way back to the far end. The white supremacists do not need to get what they want. But we do need to get back to the middle. Because if we don't get back to the middle and things continue the way they are, well, I, I can tell you where it's going to end. The white supremacists are going to be wrong in the absolute worst way possible. 
And we don't want either one of those. We don't want either extreme. We want to stay in the middle where everybody's unhappy so we can all be unhappy together and then we can all bond and commiserate in our unhappiness. Okay? There, there's the ultimate, the ultimate goal for today. We should all bond together in our unhappiness. Because if we're all unhappy, nobody's unhappy. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to leave it there. So hopefully you took something away from this, something of value. But even if you didn't, there it is. It's done. You cannot get your two hours back. No refunds. But if you did take something away from this, do me a favor then. If you haven't already done so, subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell icon so you get notified of every video when they come out. And if you know somebody else who also might need to hear this. Because maybe they see all this stuff going on and they're just apathetic to it or maybe they're one of those people that keeps asking why do they have to keep changing these things now you can send them this video and they can know why they keep changing it so share this video out with anyone you think might need it but otherwise leave a like leave a comment on the video tomorrow we are Continuing on with the um, the Final Fantasy module for Pathfinder, we're doing Knights and Archers. So that should be um, <clears throat> short, I think. I don't know. We'll see where it goes. But I suspect it's going to be short. Um, otherwise, though, if you have any topics that you would like to hear covered to keep me from, say, waiting until 16 hours before the actual lecture to try and put it together... Share it with me down below. I could use the ideas. So anything that you're curious about, anything that you might want my take on about, up to you. Leave it down below, and I will see you next time for whatever comes next. I don't even know what it is yet. And until then, take care. <laughs>